Hey guys, good morning and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Grace Hancock, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest movie news plus some insight into what it all means. Joining me today is Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy, the only movie show that guarantees you a great hair day each and every weekday that we do this show. We have a big, big broadcast to get to today. We have all this cool news about Thanos. We have all this cool stuff about The Lion King. And if you watched Game 7 last night, Dodgers, Astros, how about Star Wars? Yep, and to the left of him we have Ken Knapsack. I watched all of that, especially the Star Wars. It was great. He watched it Bye. during our live show. <laughs> <laughs> and to the left of him, we have the lovely Clark Wolf. Oh, hello, everybody. Good morning. I, w I watched the baseball games last night as well, but I didn't see the Star Wars thing there. You were too locked into what was happening on was. the field to focus on the ads. I agree. Well, you know what? I think he, it, Houston's had a rough year, so let's give him a little, a little joy. I was very uh, happy to see Houston win. I was bummed for all my Los Angeles friends that lost, but either way, we only have 364 more days until the Baltimore Orioles take the World Series in 2018. I think I read that wrong. Okay, Grace, let's get into our first official. Actually, we don't do that yet because you see that rundown right there? Don't worry, we added a little bit of force to it. The Last Jedi trailer did in fact drop last night as a 45 second teaser and uh, oh dear God, all the cool things that you wanna see in a Star Wars 45 second TV spot, this provided for me anyway. Grace, you had just entered the studio last night when we were about to do our <laughs> live reaction on Schmoes No to this very trailer. And you you guys can check out a live reaction that Ken and Christian did on the Collider video channel, which you're currently enjoying. So Grace, I'll go to you first. You saw this thing. Maybe you don't love Star Wars like I do, but how do you feel about this TV spot? I mean, don't get me wrong. I love Star Wars. I'm definitely a Star Wars nerd. That was actually part of the reason why I wanted to work for Collider like 100 years ago when I <laughs> when I joined all y'all weirdos. Um, but no, but again, I kind of said this last night. I just, I didn't, I don't know it as well as maybe you and Ken. So the, like the certain hints in the trailer that you guys were like, ah, they blew the whole third act. I like that one over my head. So I'm, I'm thrilled to see it, but I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't like wowed by this trailer. Well, Clark, a lot of that stuff goes over my head too, which I love the fact that it does because I don't need to get into the, nitty 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 gritty 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 of this trailer i just want to get excited watching luke skywalker in the millennium falcon again i it's, sorry i cut you off i want I'm you to sorry. cut me off i want <laughs> other people to gush a bit and people know how i feel about the trailer what am i going to do come out here and say man i didn't like seeing luke in his old mustang no i love seeing that stuff me too. <laughs> I, uh, I, I really loved this teaser, actually. I get to a point where I kind of say I don't want to see any more, but I feel like this little 45-second spot was the perfect amount of extra, and now I'm like, I'm done for real. I don't want to see any more. But I loved, one of the things I noticed was, you know, we've talked a lot about in the posters, the red, and we're, you know, it's casting this, like, dark mm -hmm. shadow over this film, and I kind of loved how uh, the red actually found itself in, into the the movie like I mean I noticed I actively noticed wow this is a dark looking film uh, and it looks to be dark in tone as well and the, some of the action shots just looked amazing so I'm I'm really excited yeah uh, snow clearly told his interior decorator hey we're going for something <laughs> evil so whatever you can make that come true I um, like so I, I said as well. I love getting into these things I, I love diving deep into them but I miss a lot of details but luckily I have a dear friend that is willing to watch every frame of any Star Wars material that comes out, and he's sitting to my immediate left. Ken Knapsack, the floor is yours. Yeah, man, I thought for 45 seconds that was a spectacular trailer that brought in some new things we hadn't seen, and yeah, there was, by now you can connect plot threads, you can put those little strings together, and it, it looks like there might be a big third act uh, battle that we're getting, but you know we're going to get that in a Star Wars film. We just didn't maybe know what it was. So you can start putting people at certain places in the storyline. That's fine. What we still don't know and what these, these trailers are leaving completely out, and I'm like, Clark, I wish I could never see another promotional footage, uh, footage or, or, or post or anything for The Last Jedi until December 15th. But that's not going to be the case, unfortunately. Um, but we don't see the big resolutions. We don't know is, is what decisions Rey and Kylo were making and what their paths will be and what it means that she she might be going to Snoke, or if, if, if that's Kylo, uh, you know, extending his hand from the other trailer to her. So it's setting that stuff up, the choices of these characters, and that is still a mystery, and that's that's what I love. And yep. yeah, Luke, Luke and the Falcon, 
1977 nerd chill and tear right there. I was on board <laughs> with that. And then the rest of the trailer, I thought, it, it, Star Wars does a great job of showing us a character and then having them react to something. But we don't know who they're talking to. And right, it right, might be right. having a little bit of fun with us. If you piece together all of the material that we got for The Force Awakens, you can put together a lot of that movie in retrospect. I don't think the same thing is happening with The Last Jedi. I think that they're aware of that. I think mm -hmm. that that's how they felt they had to market The Force Awakens, which I was fine with. And I think here, they're having fun with us. I think that they're, they're teasing us to some extent. Now, sure, maybe they are giving them some things away and they're rewarding the hardcore fans that are going to piece together every little thing that we've seen. But I think that if you think Rey's going to the dark side or that Rey's talking to Kylo Ren or she's actually talking to Luke or if Luke has to go to the dark side for a minute to come get Rey back or whatever you think about this, I, I've heard some theories on what the third act of this is going to be, and I don't necessarily buy them, Ken. Are you locked in on that, or do you think no. that... Are you going to be surprised when you go see this movie? Oh, I'll definitely be surprised. Again, I think they're leaving a lot of the big choices of these characters out and, and doing these, this creative cutting of, of the trailer to kind of uh, make you think... And, and we, you know, we know we're not going to get that in the trailer. So, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure if Ray is going to go bad. All those kind of things we love speculating on. I'm just not sure yet. And none of the trailers has has given me that idea, which is what I do love about what's going on. And it just looks great. It looks uh, it looks so Star Wars, which is that that phrase we love to throw out there. Um, uh, I, I'm excited. But yeah, if I could put a blindfold on and and just uh, avoid the, all of this the rest of December, unfortunately, that's not our job. Our job is to look at every frame and go, that's a porg, <laughs> and the porg's screaming. Um, so and I can't wait to see the baby porg, which was revealed yesterday, uh, that they're going to have a baby porg, Kathleen Kennedy. Wait, a smaller porg than that? Yeah, that's, yeah the Kathleen Kennedy on the Star Wars show uh, on YouTube, uh, which is a great show. I, I love what they do over there. Um, they, yeah, she revealed that the, the, at one point there's a shot of a porg at a baby porg. <laughs> Oh my gah, god. Gah, gah, gah. I'm so Oh, do you hate me? Sorry. I'll No. Should we move I, on? I was enjoying the reaction. I I I I mean, as if it couldn't get any more cute, there's going to be a smaller one, yeah. a more rat-sized rat-sized creature yeah. that's adorable. Yes. Yeah. If the Porg's name is Adelaide, then we have a whole lot of squeals to look forward to in the theater. I mean, my takeaway watching this is that I think a lot of the shots just aesthetically look amazing, like Snoke's throne room, like right. seeing all, all the red on that battle scene, which may or may not be crate, yeah. and seeing the the Finn in an X-Wing makes me very excited, because it just it's just good to know that he's going to be well, healthy, the, and he's going to be back to fighting away. Um, oh, God, did I get the oh, ship right? Oh, you got the is finger. It, well, is it a speeder? Actually, is that it a speeder? was a ski speeder, which okay. predates the rebellion. Uh, the, uh, the planet crate. Oh wow. <laughs> okay. Next story. All right. Uh, moving right along from all that fun stuff. With Thor Ragnarok and Black Panther opening before next May's Avengers Infinity War, the final pieces are falling into place for Marvel Studios' big two-part culmination of the MCU. With Josh Brolin's Thanos now stepping into the forefront as the villain to end all villains, co-director Anthony Rousseau revealed that he not only has a big role to play, he's almost a lead in the film, with his story taking on tones of a heist film as he hunts down the Infinity Stones. He explained to CNET, With Infinity War, the biggest new element to the movie is Thanos and the fact that he's entering the storytelling in a very bold, strong way to the degree that he's almost one of the leads. We've shaped an interesting narrative around him that in some ways leans heavily on a heist film and the fact that he's going after the Infinity Stones in a much bolder, successful way than he has in the past. The entire movie has that energy of a bad guy being one step ahead of the heroes. We looked at a lot of the movies that had that high style energy to them, and that brought some inspiration. Whew, Mark, what do you think of a heist movie centering on Thanos collecting the Infinity Stones? I like when the directors give us a big quote that is a mouthful that for somebody to lot. read. <laughs> because this is what I want to see in Infinity War. I want to see a villain take center stage. I want to see Thanos be the guy that we've been teased with this person for 10 movies now. So whatever entity this is, going after Infinity Stones and making it like a heist film that has worked in the MCU's favor to this point. If you look at things like The Winter Soldier, is also done by the Russo brothers that had a spy thriller element, a race against time. Even Ant-Man had a cool Ocean's Eleven feel to it. So if this is what we're getting with Infinity War, I think it's the right way to go. It's like Blumgold and Scrooge McDuck both going after treasure, and <laughs> Blumgold was always going to one step ahead of Scrooge, and they had to outwit each other. All of our heroes are going to have to band together to outsmart Thanos, whether he gets all of the Infinity Stones first, and that makes havoc for everybody, we have to stop that havoc, or we have to 
prevent him from ever getting them because once he gets them, he's going to be too powerful to stop. I'm excited about this. This has, if you're chasing after Infinity Stones, that means you're going to be going all over the galaxy. That's where our heroes get to follow Thanos. That's where they try to get cut him off at the pass here or formulate a plan. Then that's not going to work, so we have to check to plan C and plan D. This is what I want to see in Infinity War is a villain taking center stage. I think that the MCU has taken a nice step forward with their villains. If you go see Thor Ragnarok when it opens this weekend, Hela is maybe the best that I've seen from that. And if that's any hint as to what we're going to get with Thanos, we're on the right track. How do you feel about it, Clark? Yeah, I agree with you. And I really love, I you know, we've talked about this before, but I love when that Marvel kind of each film that's inside their stable of movies is sort of like a different type of movie. Um, was still, you know, filling in their, their Marvel um, checking their Marvel quota, of course, but um, so I love this. And also, I the thing that stands out to me is, you know, there's going to be a lot of story that they're going to have to cram into Infinity War. But the idea of a heist thriller says it's going to move, and I like that. Like, I want to see that energy. I want it. I want it to be fast paced and energetic and entertaining. Um, and you know, they've been, gosh, they've been teasing Thanos for so long. So it sounds like when he's finally going to be a part of the picture, he's going to be a big part of the picture and that's that's cool ken knapps like will this be the best heist movie since hudson hawk whoa 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 i'm one of those uh people that watches the oceans 11 remake and cries at the end because it's so emotional so <laughs> let's go with that one um and seriously bellagio that i i've reenacted that scene too many times oh, in my the, real life the fountain yeah, yeah that's a great scene anyways yeah but it makes me think of that and clark great point we know infinity uh war is gonna have a lot of characters a lot of moving parts so what's maybe a theme to get it going and get it going mm. in uh, quickly uh thanos you're right too mark uh villains and marvel but on the, you know, we so him front and center, he needs to be. He's the biggest villain of all in these franchises, uh, in this Marvel MCU. So that's good. And then I'm, I'm confident because Captain America Winter Soldier, which is actually, I th I'd say, is my favorite of the Marvel movies, is a is, is a is a 70s political thriller. And that's what the Russo brothers did. So they they can take influences that that aren't necessarily superhero uh, tropes, and they could put them in these movies and make it work. So I I'm excited with this idea. It, it might work on a lot of fronts. Yeah, Clark, there's a few stones that are unaccounted for, and that's what I'm worried about. Mm -hmm. So I think, to my knowledge, we have the time stone, that's good. Doctor Strange and team, they got that one cool. Then you got your power stone, that's at Nova Corp. And then you have the space stone, which had the Tesseract. That, uh, we, we we're not sure where that is right now. We're not sure where the reality stone is. Is. Um, we don't know where the mind stone is. I don't believe we know where the soul stone is. Do any of these stones that I'm telling you right now we see? I think the soul stone might actually be in Wakanda. I'm not sure about you that. You may as well be speaking another language to me. Like, and <laughs> I, I, and I, I, this is something that I actually really do wonder about Marvel and their future and their storytelling. Like, I am a Marvel, I go see all the Marvel movies, I enjoy them, I watch them, I pay attention to them. But the bigger picture stuff of whatever, like the nitty gritty details, I can't, I don't keep up with it. I, I, I seriously have, I'm like, okay, you could, you could tell me whatever you could say. Santa Claus has a stone and I'd be like, all right, cool. Let's see Santa. <laughs> the um, stress of the infinity stones and keeping everything straight because it was just brought to my attention. The mind stone is currently what's giving vision light. Uh, yes, that's the thing. Yeah. I was going to say that. Now, think, Ken, yeah. Trying to sort out these stones gives me, too, me kidney me stones from yeah. the stress. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what this though. Bail Organa went to crate as a base <laughs> to get the rebellion, a little base of operation prior to a new hope. Grace Hancock, <laughs> keeping track of all these stones and keeping track of these separate movie universes, which Ken has to have Marvel crossover with Star Wars. Let's just get back to the Thanos and the fact it's going to be a heist movie. Does that seem like the right direction to go in for this big epic adventure that's going to be the culmination of everything we've worked for for the last 10 years? Absolutely. I totally agree with Clark. There is a lot of moving parts that are, it is hard to keep up with all of it. So I think to have it be kind of like the through line is that it's a heist is great. Ocean's 11, Ocean's 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, all great films. Um, and I love villains. I'm rooting for the villains. I'm rooting for Kylo. I hope Ray goes <laughs> evil. I hope Mark Hamill goes evil. So I'm excited to see Thanos because I love bad guys. Uh, Ken, who wins in a fight, Vision or Darth Vader? Oh, clearly that's uh, Vision. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Clearly. Okay, Ken, throwing that slider. Grace, I think it's time to move on from Infinity War into something that's just going to make everybody happy when the sun rises. 
<laughs> Let's do it, because Disney announced yesterday the full cast list and synopsis for their upcoming Lion King live action adaptation, and in doing so, finally confirmed Beyonce in the role as Nala. The full cast list now includes Donald Glover as Simba, Seth Rogen and Billy Eichner as Pumbaa and Timon, John Oliver as Zazu, Chiwetel Ejiofor as Scar, Alfre Woodard as Simba's mother, Sarabi, John Connie as the wise baboon, Rafiki, and James Earl Jones reprising his role as Mufasa. The hyena pack was also named that includes Eric Andre as Azizi, Black Panther's Florence Kasumba as Shenzi, and Keegan-Michael Key as Kamari. Mm -hmm. The Lion King is set for theaters on July 19th, 2019. Clark, thoughts on the full cast list announcement for The Lion King? Yeah, I mean, this is a great cast. This is an incredible cast. I think everybody is very well cast in their roles. And, um, you know, I, uh, I I do think it's kind of funny, though, that, you know, like they're releasing a synopsis. Like, yeah, we've, <laughs> we've seen The Lion King. I mean, I think I know the synopsis <laughs> of the story. I don't think I need it written out. But, but uh, you know, I think I really enjoyed The Jungle Book. Um, I loved what Jon Favreau did with it. And I think that this is a real passion project for his as well. Um, and, and I'm excited to see what they what they do. Because when I walked out of The Jungle Book, the, the first thing I said was, God, I would love to see the Lion King done like that. And that's exactly what they did. So, um, you know, I think it's cool. I just, my question with this, and I, and I think the cast is fantastic. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have any problem with that. It's just, it's still, I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking in my head where the Jungle Book was able to have more freedom to move the storyline in different mm -hmm. ways than I think the Lion King is going to have just because it's still more recent in our past and we we love that movie know every beat of it a lot of people grew up watching the jungle book like i did but i forgot a lot of the ways that story moved and so i think that they was able to be like oh we want to do this we want to leave that out the lion king's gonna have a more difficult time doing that but just based on this cast announcement yesterday i am thrilled from head to toe, from the leads all the way down to everybody that is in this picture. Happy to see Eric Andre being one of the hyenas. And Beyonce's Nala was the, the rumor, maybe it was the worst kept secret around the Lion King that we're going to get Beyonce's Nala. My only question now is do we also get Beyonce performing songs in the movie too? Do we right. have her team up with Elton John to do Can You Feel the Love Tonight? Or is, is bringing Elton back too much? And we just stick with James Earl Jones. Grace, your thoughts on this entire cast? I mean, yeah, I'm thrilled. I'm also very curious to see because The Lion King is one of the most iconic Disney films, whereas Jungle Book was maybe kind of under the radar a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Lion King's way more mainstream. They've made, again, like five of them. There's like Lion King two and three quarters and like four other ones that we all loved. But um, so it's hard to have The Lion King without all of the iconic music. So I'm wondering how that's going to work and if they are going to have the music. Yeah, Ken, do you think that we need all the music back as well? And then what's your take on the entire cast announcement? I, I this is a, It's a great cast and, and there's some wonderful names and yeah anytime you can get queen beyonce on something you do it right <laughs> you know you make her make her sing you make her dance whatever she wants to do she wants to be the cinematographer she can do it <laughs> um i'm on it yeah what's interesting to me and talking about the music and, and like you said clark we, we you know generally we've all seen this and 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 we know and it's a live action quotation marks around live action uh about this it, it's weird because this could be a cover song this could be a cover song, and Beauty and the Beast was kind of a cover song with Emma Watson. And that's, you know, the greatest rock and roll single of all time, 1992, Life is a Highway by Canadian <laughs> rocker Tom Cochran. Uh, formerly Whoa. Red Rider. That is Red Rider. That's the greatest rock and roll single of all time, as a rock radio DJ I can tell you. <laughs> when Rascal Flatts did their cover of it like five years ago, it was like... I mean, I mean, they hit all the chords, so it's it's a little it's a it's it's tough. These cover songs are tough. I have full faith in in, in Favreau and team, and this cast is amazing. And and bringing James Earl Jones back is uh, is just the right amount of like tipping your cap to what came before. So a full faith. Uh, we'll see though. We talk about the songs and everything. Where will they want to branch out? Is the question. Uh, Shrek did that too with "I'm a Believer." It wasn't. It wasn't the monkeys version. It was. It was somebody else. Smash and Mouth. Yeah, and it's like, okay, I uh, see what you did, but um, uh, I'm I'm sticking with uh, Davy Jones <laughs> in the high school dance, Clark. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. But look, um, I'm so glad Ken you brought up the idea of a cover of the cover song because I recently just watched Beauty and the Beast. And I mean, I couldn't finish it. I just mm. really didn't like it. But regardless of that, I know that movie like the back of my hand, Beauty and mm. the Beast was one of my favorite movies as a child. And I could still, it was verbatim the same. Mm. I mean, it was the same. It was a cartoon, but with 
people. So yeah. I did not like that. It's like, what are you bringing to the table? You're mm. not bringing anything to the table. The thing that, uh, but so on the one hand, you have Disney learning of an important lesson, hey, this works and people don't care, right? right? Because pe Beauty and the Beast was a huge hit and the audience didn't mind watching basically a cartoon acted out for them. But on the other hand, Jon Favreau, I, I, something tells me no, he's not going to just replay the exact same thing. I think he, he would not be involved if he wasn't going to be able to add to the story and tell a bit of a different story. Um, so, so I think that's important to keep in mind. Uh, I just Googled I'm a believer to make sure that it was the monkeys, and it was the monkeys. My music knowledge is not in question here. But the first thing that came up, Smash Mouth's video from oh, I'm a believer. Stop. Yeah. Uh, stop. Millennials. Mm. Millennials. Neil, Neil Diamond wrote, I think Neil Diamond wrote that song, too. Uh, right? Did he really? I then he gave it to the monkeys? Yeah, he, like, he, he wrote a lot more. of songs for them, yeah. So I don't know. I could be wrong on that. But, Neil. Yeah. You know who uh, used to hang out with the monkeys a lot? Jack Nicholson. Jack Nicholson directed their movie Head. Yes, he did. This is why you tune into Collider Movie Talk, mm -hmm. guys, to get this kind of late 60s music <laughs> knowledge. We have a lot of fun here in our fantasy land, whether we're talking about Avengers or The Lion King. We're going to go back to a galaxy far, far away. But there is a news story that broke yesterday that is not on the rundown, and that is that Warner Brothers has severed ties with shitty director Brett Ratner, or <laughs> Brett Ratner decided to leave Warner Brothers in his contract to work on his personal issues. That statement from Brett Ratner came out about an hour before Warner Brothers officially announced that it was severing ties. So you can believe whoever you want to believe this comes on the heels of no less than six women coming forward and alleging various acts of sexual misconduct, harassment, or worse against Brett Ratner. Those actresses include Olivia Munn and Natasha Henstridge. And it's one of these things where I don't like reporting this kind of stuff because it's just so dirty and sort of even read how awful these, these things were. But I do feel it as my duty as the host of Quieter Movie Talk to illuminate you guys to all the things that are going on in and around the world of movies. And Brett Ratner is somebody who you've heard probably a lot of creepy stories about for a long time. And whether you want to believe it or not, that is totally up to you. You're allowed to have an opinion on that, just like I am. And with this case in particular, I think that... I am going to buy everything that I'm hearing from these women that are coming forward. And it comes on the heels of earlier this week where you had one allegation against Kevin Spacey and then a whole lot more primarily men coming forward against Kevin Spacey and then him making an announcement that he's going to step away from acting to take some time. So um, I'm not going to give bravo to Kevin Spacey or Brett Ratner for taking time to work on their personal issues, whatever they may be, because you should have been doing this a long time ago. This is more me saying once again thank you to everybody who is stepping forward in a very tough place against people who are in a very powerful position and saying we're not going to take this kind of stuff anymore. I always do like to open up the pulpit to anybody else on the panel who wants to share their thoughts on this Brett Ratner Warner Brothers issue. Clark? Yeah, I mean, all I'll say is that um, it's two, it's twofold. You know, the 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 financial implication. Uh, you know, Rat Pack Dune produces like everything at Warner Brothers, and that's why we have to talk about it. It's important to talk about it because I don't know how you separate him from this multi-billion-dollar company that is, you know, that that is working with one of the biggest studios in Hollywood and making some of the biggest movies in the in of the year. So that's the one thing on the pers on a personal level. All I'll say is I have had dinner with Brett Ratner uh, and a group of people and uh, none of these women's stories surprise me. Ken Napsack. Hey, yeah, this is interesting times, right? All these uh, people being brought down and, and uh, I want to actually address the idea that uh, this witch hunt idea that I hear a lot about. What, what, what? Look, man, read these stories. This isn't Brett Ratner asked Olivia Munn out for Froyo inappropriately. <laughs> this is a long history, a long abuse of power, and, and I'm, I, for one, am, am happy that this stuff is starting to come out. It's, it's uncomfortable, it's, it's tough, but it's creating conversations. This isn't the only industry that suffers from this consistent uh, belittling and overlooking and abuse of women. This is not the only industry. So uh, we're just the most, uh, the movie industry is the most uh, uh, one in the spotlight right now. Um, so this should create conversations elsewhere. And and again, it, it's some of it tough. There's stuff came out about Dustin Hoffman that I know I'm a fan of Dustin, Dustin Hoffman. And you read these stuff and it kind of 
makes you go like this. Bill Cosby, go back to that. That's the reason I got into stand-up comedy. That was tough to deal with. Uh, so uh, it, it's a tough time, but but also, again, to, to those that are because we see them in the comments or you'll see this, this stuff, uh, you know, let's be honest, we have a large percent of... of of a male demographic, Mark. So this is important to talk about because um, this this isn't just minor little things. Not the, to excuse those, by the way, also, but just th this is a, a a history, a hundred plus year history of the movie industry where this was going on. And to, to consider changing that culture is a good thing. It's a good thing. If, and if Titans have to fall, that's that's what has to happen. That's right. And if some of our beloved art has to be sacrificed in the process, then I'm all for that as well. Because like I'm like you guys. I love going to movies and not thinking about the real world. I love escaping from it and not thinking about, oh, what is it, what personal choices does this actor or this director or this writer make in their lives? I just want to be in this world, whatever they're showing me on the screen. But if I had the choice of saying, oh, I just get to go live in fantasy land for two hours whenever I want to, or I have people who feel comfortable in a world sharing their stories and outing people who have wronged them in a sexually inappropriate way, then I'm taking that every day of the week. Just real fast, it's, it is tied to the industry, by the way, because this is a director and a producer preying on actresses. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not, it's not as simple as just, oh yeah, this guy was a jerk at a party one time. This is a guy with power that is directly tied into the industry. This is a workplace issue, and these actresses are having to deal with this in the workplace. Like, I know it's fun to think about Hollywood, and it's like, oh, glamorous, and everybody just hangs out and has a good time. This is hard work and uh and these women's careers are being affected that's why this matters it's Sorry. systemic and i'm glad that it's having a light shed on it now as late as it may be and i'm glad that again if even if movie talk can just for a couple minutes when a story like this comes out that we can provide some sort of shelter for anybody who wants to vent Wh whatever your opinion whether you agree or disagree with us even bring it up on this show it's fine for you to have that i just feel like as the host of this show it's important to not just talk about fantasy land it's also important to talk about the real issues that are affecting hollywood today and with that we thankfully get to go back to a galaxy far, far away for buy or sell. What we do on buy or sell is that Grace is going to give us a topic. Then we'll say whether we buy it or sell it. And we're going to use Ken's Bitcoin <clears throat> account. Oh, yeah. <laughs> In a new interview with the Star Wars show, head of Lucasfilm Kathleen Kennedy said shed some light on their Star Wars plans after Episode 9 hits theaters. She revealed that the Star Wars franchise will continue on past Episode 9 for at least the next 10 years by even focusing on some of the new characters established in the sequel trilogy. Kennedy said, We're looking at the next 10 years of Star Wars stories. We're looking at narratively where that might go, future stories beyond Episode 9 with these new characters, Ray, Poe, Finn, BB-8. We're also looking at people who are interested in coming into the Star Wars Wars world and taking us places we haven't been yet. So, Ken, mm -hmm. would you buy or sell more Star Wars movies featuring Ray, Poe, Finn, and BB-8 after Episode Nine, either in a new trilogy or in a standalone film? I mean, I buy it because I need a career. <laughs> I'm going to be 75 uh, talking Star Wars. Uh, you know, uh, so let's look at Ray Junior's Funko Pop figure. I'm going to need that. Um, but I, uh, Ray Junior, I love this. Yeah, you know, and Kathleen Kennedy. Um, you know, uh, Ray Palpatine the Third. Let's let's talk about that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, Kathleen Kennedy was, didn't say they're locked into this. They're talking about it. Uh, this idea of bringing in uh, new people, which include, you know, hopefully soon a female director, uh, and, and taking it to places we haven't been yet, which might be Old Republic. A lot of things they're talking about. I think standalone or these anthology films, Mark, are going to be what they stick with for a while. I'd, after nine, I don't see uh, the idea of a, of, a, of a new trilogy coming in for a while, which might be okay. Uh, but who knows? At the end of nine, we may, be, we may want to see more of Ray and Kylo. There may be something that makes us think, what is their adventures beyond that? Um, I, I'm a little worried as a you know, Star Wars fan uh, who spent so much of his life on it that at some point, maybe I wouldn't like to just stop and take it all in instead of having to deal with, uh, now we're getting Greedo's story. Like, I don't, there, that's, <laughs> some pacing might be the biggest thing about this. But there, it's, uh, I like what she's saying about it. We're just kind of looking at where we might want to take this universe. Look, I love nothing more and getting on the high dive with you and doing a deep jump into all of this Star Wars speculation as to what we're going to get in the next 10 years. I think you're crazy if you think that we're just going to have episode 9 and they're going to take their sweet time doing a new trilogy. They're not going to mm. kill off Finn and Ray and Poe and BB-8 and poor. Well, they might. maybe a poor is going to die. I just want to prepare everybody. I'm not rooting for it. I'm just saying.
saying it, it, it's within. They killed Ewoks, guys. They killed Ewoks. Nanta. Okay? They, Nanta died. He died for you. I think that we're going to get a new trilogy sooner rather than later. Now, whether that is, oh, we're going to take two years off, we're going to take three years off instead of the customary two years between the episodic movies, I don't think they're going to take a big breath in between that. I think that they are going to leave us on some sort of happy note, hopefully with episode nine, because I don't think it's happening with The Last Jedi, <laughs> and we're going to be feeling really good about ourselves. Then we're going to have a new adventure to get excited about. I do agree with you when it comes to these standalone movies. Clark, my hesitation with this, mm -hmm. and I say this as a giant Star Wars fan, is that I know that, that Christian's been saying for a while that he thinks that we could come to a day and age where we get multiple Star Wars films in one calendar year. Mm -hmm. I still don't want that. I, yeah. I love Star Wars, and I, part of why I love Star Wars, and this is why I enjoy the trailers and the TV spots, is because I love that feeling of getting hyped up. I love that, what I refer to as the tantric experience of waiting and getting excited mm -hmm. to see a new Star Wars movie. I need time to recover and digest and then get into something new because I hold these movies holier than in any MCU or DCU movies because I could have a few of those a year that all tie into each other. I want my Star Wars. It's like going to Morton Steakhouse, Clark. It's, I, I can't do it every night, but when I go, I make sure that I'm really hungry. Yeah, I, I agree with you, actually. I think that the legacy of Star Wars is that it's a really special franchise. You know what I mean? It Whether it was started that way or not, it it's unique. And the fact that there was this trilogy and there was always talk about more and then the universe expanded in books or in comics or in you know so many different ways, but those films, those actual episodes films were really special those first three and so I think that um, I agree with you I think that they should take their time and treat this like it like like the precious I mean I, I hate it sound ridiculous saying that about movies but I think it's true it is a precious franchise in a day and age um, in an industry that is filled with with excess right so um, I think at the end of the day if they have an architect if they are planning this out I think that's that's the way to go right they need to take into consideration um, the future starting now, you know, and and hopefully maintain um, the the affection and affinity for this franchise. Yeah, Grace, um, we get very excited when we hear any Star Wars announcement, whether it's a movie or it's Star Wars Land, it's going to be a Disneyland and Disney World in a few years. So do you see a time coming when we need to pump the brakes on the movies a little bit? Or is Kathleen Kennedy dead on when she's like, we're just going to keep this train rolling? No, I, I wouldn't even say that I don't feel that that's now because I feel like there's a certain romanticism to there being a finite amount of films for something. There's a, we a reason. There's a reason. <laughs> there's a reason why Lord of the Rings, the trilogy, not The Hobbit, is going to forever be on my top shelf is because Tolkien and there's no like canon world of Tolkien. Like, they're not going to be going back to that. Thank God The Hobbit is over is what the hell was that? Like, it's always going to be on my top shelf because nobody can touch it because there is a finite number of the films and nobody can ruin that world for me. So I feel like we're already there. I'm already kind of like, okay, but like, I don't want to go crazy. Like, I don't want to be like somebody's granddaughter's friends, aunt's cousin. Remember in that one scene and then the robot who like blew himself up on purpose? It's like, <laughs> then we're stretching and then it does take away the specialness of the franchise. I think we're getting a lot more trilogies, a lot more standalone films. And in 20 years, we're going to get the re-release of The Force Awakens. Awakens <laughs> with new added effects. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ugh. See if we want to see that or not. And our next story is uh, something that takes place on Earth, and in particular, the ice skating rink. <laughs> That was the best segue of all time. Uh, it, it was my best, but thank you. <laughs> Neon has released the first full trailer for the Tanya Harding biopic, I, Tanya. Directed by Lars and the Real Girls' Craig Gillespie, the film chronicles the life of figure skater Tanya Harding from her rough upbringing to Olympic infamy, tracking the path that led to the violent incident with Nancy Kerrigan. The movie stars Margot Robbie as Harding, along with Sebastian Stan, Allison Janney, and Julianne Nicholson, opening on, in theaters on December 8th. You can also check out the review from TIFF, as well as Steve Weintraub's extended interview with Gillespie on Collider.com. Mark, buy or sell the first full red band trailer for I, Tanya. I buy it, I guess. Uh, the performances look great. It looks like a, a, a very well done dramatic retelling of an event that I, I just find so gross and disgusting as somebody who's like a competitive person and loves watching the Olympics and, and figure skating. I don't care about it except for those four years when I get to watch it at the Olympics. And I remember when this story was happening, I was a kid and I was just like, I just felt it was so unfair. So I've always had that ingrained in my head that Nancy Kerrigan just totally got robbed of her chance to win a gold medal. Maybe she's more America's sweetheart because of all these things that happened to her. But 
it, I don't want this to get to a point where when, when we're sensationalizing Tanya Harding, if you want to make her a sympathetic character in some regard, I understand that from what her upbringing is. I think Allison Janney looks like the one that right. could be winning an Oscar. Margot Robbie looks fantastic as Tanya Harding as well. Um, so I just, I, I hate when they sensationalize stories like this for movies, but I'm also a huge fan of Goodfellas and the <laughs> people are calling this the Goodfellas of the ice skating world. So I'm going to buy the trailer, Ken. Uh, I will buy it for the curiosity. It looks it looks more like a Coen Brothers movie yeah. than I thought it would be. But that's also because, again, you talk about uh, I, I was very much of age when this happened. I was a big fan of the Olympics. Me and my dad used to sit down and study them every four years. Uh, uh, 92 Olympics, so this would be the winter mm -hmm. winter games. Uh, 92 summer games were, were, uh, were pretty big in our household, too. So I, I'm fascinated by this just from, from like, oh, I remember this so clear. Wow. What? Like I remember all of that. Like I remember watching Sports Center every day, trying to figure this out, and all these names started coming out. And and now in this twenty four second news cycle we have, uh, where things, even horrible things, are forgotten twenty minutes later. Like this was every day. It was like you went to school. Like who? Do, right. Who do you think did that? Who do you think did that? So I'm fascinated. I have to buy it just from uh, a nostalgia history. Side. Yeah. So the Winter Olympics, I think it was ninety four because ninety two. Remember was Barcelona. Well, in I, the they, Summer they Olympics. They switched. Then... They used to be all the same year, and then ah. I think ninety four. They they. They jump back so they could alternate every two years with the with the winter and summer games. Well, it used to be the same. Olympic brain on Ken. Yeah, eighty eight was nerd. Seoul and Calgary. That's what I know. That you know so much about so many things. Life is indeed a highway. <laughs> when you're Ken Knapsack. Uh Clark, your take on the I Tanya Red Band trail? I buy it. I buy it real. I, I love. I think it. I love the comparison to a Coen <laughs> Brothers movie. I mean, I think and Neon is doing such cool things. They're also the company that put out Colossal with Anne Hath Hathaway and Jason Sudeikis. Which, if you haven't seen Colossal, it's a. It's great. It's but these fil films are unique, and uh, and you know I I agree with you though, Mark. I hope they don't glamorize. Uh, but but based on this trailer. I don't think there's anything glamorous about there. I don't think they're trying to do anything glamorous with this story. Um, but uh, I also want to say that um, I look, I think Margot Robbie is beautiful and I think she is a pretty good actress, but I've never quite understood um, why people respond to her so, so much. And, but just from this promotional material, she looks fantastic. And so I really hope uh, that this is a, this is a knockout performance. Yeah. Grace, were you as taken with the trailer? as we were as far as the performances go? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as an actor, like, there's nothing more fun than being, like, an ugly, horrible, mean character. Like, that's the dream. So, yeah, I kind of am with you. Like, I feel like Margot Robbie's done a lot of, like, accents, and we're like, she's fantastic. And I'm like, well... No, but I think that this might be the kind of thing where this is going to really, really show her stuff. And I'm really excited. This looks like a really fun film. Well, you are going to get an ugly, horrible character. It's going to be a huge <laughs> shark in our next story. Woo! All right, guys. For fans of the upcoming giant shark movie, now retitled The Meg, yeah! and starring Jason Statham to be a bloody R-rated action movie from director John Turtletop, Ow! you might be a little disappointed. The movie, based on Steve Alton's shark attack novel Meg, has now been rated PG-13 by the MPAA 4, action, peril, bloody images, and some language. The film also stars award-winning Chinese actress Li Bingbing, Kling Cur I'm sorry, Cliff Curtis, <laughs> Rain Wilson, and Ruby Rose, and hits theaters on August 10th, 2018. Clark, do you buy or sell the PG-13 rating for The Meg? I mean, I, <laughs> no, I sell it. I sell it. Who wants to watch Ooh. a PG-13 shark movie? Nobody. Nobody. Come on. Now, I will say, though, this is not surprising to me. When Eli Roth was uh, left this project due to creative differences and John Turtletop came on, uh, and, uh, you know, I think it was very clear that this is supposed to be a big summer, everybody gets to go see it, um, you know, a uh, worldwide movie. And so it is not surprising to me that this is uh, going to be a PG-13 affair. And I should, I, I'm always the one saying that PG-13 movies can be just as scary as you know as um as anything else but I'm just a little disappointed. I maybe would have liked to see a little more carnage. Yeah, my, my track <laughs> record of buying everything that has to do with Meg or the Meg is in danger right now because I, I, as much as I would have preferred to see an R-rated gore fest, I'm going to fall back on my favorite shark movie and maybe my favorite non-Star Wars film of all time, Jaws. That was rated PG. Now, it was before we had the PG rating and it wasn't rated R, so everybody could go see Jaws and there was a lot of you know danger of what is under the water as opposed to actually showing us the carnage although we did see what happened to Quinn at the end of that movie. I don't think that this movie is going to be 
on a cinematic level as good as Jaws. Just a shot in the dark there. But I think it's going to be a fun summer adventure, which is why you have the National Treasure guy come in and do it. So uh, I'm going to buy it, Ken. I'm going to buy anything with this movie. I'm buying the Meg PG-13. You can do it. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sell. I sell in the sentence of, "Do you want to see Jason Statham, Jason Statham in?" I'll be like, "Sell, sell, sell." So, um, uh. as far as a, uh, yeah, PG Jaws, Jaws was PG, but the ratings were different. Believe me, I was there in the theaters in 1984 when the PG-13 rating was born, and I'm still traumatized by Temple of Doom. And uh, <laughs> so, I know PG-13 movies can be a little scary for the younger kids, but I know what you mean, Clark, too. About maybe you just want to see a. A shark use a full f bomb. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm just gonna sell. This whole thing just seems silly. Okay, so we got two buys, right? And we have I, one sell. It, uh, yeah. uh, Grace. Oh, hard sell, my friends. Okay. Like hard sell. Okay. First of all, what could top Sharknado? Secondly, I do not like sharks. I do not like water. I do not like sharks or water films. Mm. I'm also an adult, and I don't want to see PG-13 movies because I'm not 13. Kind of like watching network TV and then you watch HBO and you're like, oh, okay. That's kind of how I feel about PG-13 ratings. Um, so just all all the hard passing that there is. Uh, bold stance against water there. Wow. <laughs> really? Stan, I guess no, you're I mean, I really, like, drinker? this would, this, if I saw this, like, I would not sleep for years. For years. Like, just that graphic i can't look at yeah, it yeah it's pretty like cool, i huh? my palms are sweaty i'm not it's a, kidding it's a it, the, the one in the one in jaws is debatable whether it's 20 or 25 feet this this carcanon megalodon we're digging up 75 feet oh god of pure I can't. shark goodness oh. that's rated pg-13 because he curbs his language for all you kiddies out there <laughs> i want to remind you guys that we also have our brand new series the top 50 superhero movies of all time debuted yesterday we're going to be dropping a new episode each and every weekday in the morning so check out the collider top 50 superhero movies you can go there around 9 a.m 11 a is if you go there in the morning and check it out we're talking about superhero movies eight it doesn't matter math is hard i like 75 foot sharks and also i'm gonna toss it over to gracie real quick because we do have a uh, a new uh, gig on collider video that uh, i know you got a chance to participate in. oh yes you guys we have something super exciting for you today at noon the very first collider ladies night is dropping our very first episode has Woo-hoo. Taika Watiti in it. He was a lot of fun. It's really exciting. We're all really proud of this project, so please check it out. Tweet us. Let us know what you think. I make an appearance. You'll like it. Ladies night. Make sure you guys watch that right here on Collider Video. We also have an all-new Heroes going to be up later on today. Some Thor Ragnarok goodness. We already have the non-spoiler review up. We're going to get some spoiler stuff up this weekend as well. Without further ado, we're going to issue mailbag in favor of going right to your live Twitter questions. You can tweet us anytime during the show at Collider Video. We'll close our eyes, pick out a few of them, and see what carnage ensues. So what do we got, Grace? All right, so I know you guys like sports ball, so we're going to go with our friend Jonathan Caro. In celebration of the World Series, what is your favorite baseball movie, and what was your first baseball game you ever attended? Oh, first baseball game I ever attended was a magical moment with me and my old man at Memorial Stadium, the old place where the Orioles used to play. And I don't remember much of the game, but I remember my dad put me on his shoulders at the end because we had a base runner on third base, and we were tied, and it was the bottom of the ninth, and Jim Traber came up to bat, and my dad looked up to me. He said, if this guy gets a hit, we win the game. Next pitch, Traver gets a single. We score the run. Orioles win. And Mark Ellis' life, it was all downhill from there. (laughs) I'm going to say that my favorite baseball movie of all time was I, I I have to go with Field of Dreams. Yeah. I think it's just it's just too good. It just holds up so well on repeat viewings. I just saw the Kevin Costner baseball movie, which he's fond of making these things, uh, for the love of the the game. game, Woo, what a hell of a picture. I was surprised it's, to go on. It's actually pretty good, yeah. See, like, critics kind of ravaged that no, thing when it came good. out. I think it's one hell of a movie. And, um, yeah, Kevin Costner, Detroit Tigers, rooting for you. John C. Riley was his catcher in that That's movie. Right. That's uh, right. F- Field of Dreams, Eight Men Out, and I'm sorry, but all ten innings of Ken Burns' documentary, mm-hmm, Baseball, mm-hmm, I've watched mm-hmm. that l- 20 times. Ooh, it's a good it, pull. It's fascinating. Love it. Baseball is my sport. My first game was in... July 5th, 6th, I think, uh, July of 1988, Jack Murphy Stadium, Padres against the Pirates. Padres won 43 and 10 innings on a Chris Brown single. Jose Lean hit his second home run of the season, only two he hit that year. Uh, and John Cruck was in left field, made a diving catch. Cruck used to be able to move. Uh, it's interesting you saw that in Jack Murphy Stadium in 1988. You know what happened a couple months prior in Jack Murphy Stadium? 
Uh, a little Super Bowl action. Oh, Doug Williams had himself yeah. a second quarter, didn't he? Google it, kids. It's worth the look. Clark Wolf, favorite baseball picture and a good baseball memory you may or may not well, have. It could involve Chipper Jones. I do, it absolutely <laughs> involves Chipper Jones. I uh, grew up in Atlanta when the Braves were the one, yeah. as Mr. Ken Burns has said, one of the best ball clubs mm -hmm. in the history of the game. So it's actually kind of funny because once that era was over, I was very confused. I was like, what do you mean we didn't go to the World Series? this year I, I yeah. don't understand <laughs> I just was so used to having this this like really iconic team uh, but my parents had season tickets uh, right behind home plate and uh, we I used to go to the games all the time favorite baseball movie will show you my age and my generation the Sandlot Oh, love the God, Sandlot. Sandlot. I still love the Sandlot. I don't even think it's nostalgic. I just think it's. I still think it's very sweet and uh, and a great and a great baseball movie. Yeah, I was thinking they should have uh, the kid who played uh, Benny come out and throw the first pitch last night. You yeah. know, because he be he went to the Dodgers. Benny the, Dodgers. He's Benny he's the Jet Rodriguez. Is he really? He's a firefighter in uh, in LA. Yeah. Oh, okay. LA, LA, LA City Fire. Yeah. Good for him. Yeah. Well, look at you, Benny. Well yeah. done. How's the beast doing? Uh, Hercules? Yeah, uh, yeah. Hercules. Hercules. <laughs> oh, I love me some Hercules. Uh, Grace, you have a favorite baseball movie, baseball memory? You know, I actually really liked that film a couple years ago with Brad Pitt and, uh, and Seth Rogen. Moneyball. Uh, Money thank you. Yeah, uh, I Jonah like Hill. That. Jonah Hill. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Jonah Hill. Um, but yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you know. But actually, no, I do have a good baseball story. Um, I'm from Arizona, so I'm so tan. And uh, my first baseball game was the Arizona Diamondbacks. Hell yeah. And my sister was with me. We were pretty young. And she, when we were like screaming, she accidentally spit her gum out into the girl's hair in front of us. And the whole, and I mean, like pretty early on in the game. And for the whole game, we were like, what do we, I mean, do we say, I mean, what do we do? Should we tell mom and dad? Like, I don't know. And so we just didn't say anything. And she left with gum in her hair. And it's haunted me forever, but it was hilarious. She literally was like, you could and see it. It's like a little huge... girl grew up to be Gal Gadot. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, I, I like that this show can do a number of different things and zig and zag, but the fact that we allow. Grace Hancock to purge this, <laughs> yeah, this thing yeah. that has just been I'm very sorry. for so long. If you were at a Diamondbacks game in the 90s and you came home with gum in your I'm so sorry. What it wasn't me, it was my sister. So take she's, it up with her. She's sorry on behalf of the entire family. She did throw her sister under the bus. <laughs> I won't point that out. You know, Ken, the Diamondbacks, uh, they had a pretty good game seven once upon a time. I'll tell you what, uh, end of the Yankee dynasty, 2001. But I'll tell you what's interesting about that. Uh, we could go on for a while. You know, that win delayed, <laughs> that win delayed a flight for someone named Luis Soho who was a uh, New York Yankees uh -huh. utility infielder. I think it was Soho. God, I'd be if it's not him. But uh, that flight crashed. <gasps> and he would have been on that flight Oof. if the Yankees had won in game six. Wow. So good I, job, Diamondbacks. You're welcome. Never ended movie talk on a note quite like that. But that is how we're going to say <laughs> goodbye to all of you. I want to thank the entire panel for Classy Clark Wolf, Ken Knapsack, Grace Hancock, and the entire crew. We appreciate you guys watching here on Collider Movie Talk. I'll be the Syracuse Funny Bone this weekend, but I'll be back on Monday for more Collider Movie Chat Movie Talk. Read that wrong. <laughs> Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode of Collider Movie Talk. You want to watch more? Then click up here or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. And if you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.